All right, we'll be moving on to genomics research to elucidate the genetics of rare diseases, or Gregor. This is also a renewal. Um, and Lisa Chadwick, also in the Division of Genome Sciences, will be presenting the concept. Okay. Well, I'm here today to present our concept for the second phase of our Gregor program. I'm, of course, speaking up here on behalf of the larger team, which includes Chris Wellington, Heather Colley, uh, Gabby Villard, and Sarah Curran, who was our previous program analyst. Of course, she left us and went to graduate school, but she's done a lot to help us get to where we are now, and so I could not not thank her. So I will start with using a chart that I use a lot. Um, Jessica Chong at the University of Washington keeps this updated, and this shows the number of new gene phenotype associations every year for like the last 35 years that are in OMEN. And the color of the bars shows you how those discoveries were made. So the blue bars, blue-ish, uh, shows the discoveries made using sort of old school methods like positional cloning. Um, but the purpose of showing you this graph is to show really how innovation can change the game. So around 2010, you'll see the impact of in innovation in genomic technology development. Um, that is uh, like primarily whole exome sequencing. The discoveries that were made using next generation sequencing are the ones in yellow bars. And of course, at the same time, there was concurrent innovation in the area of computational analysis, right? Because we needed new methods to analyze that kind of data to identify causal variants. Um, a lot of that was driven by one of NHGRI's programs, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, which ran for about 10 years uh, until 2021. Um, and now, where we are, exome sequencing is really like the standard approach in clinical genetics. But we know that it misses a lot still. So over half of the people with suspected genetic disorders um, who get this sort of standard clinical genetic testing don't come away from that with a diagnosis. And then they're just kind of on hold, right? Um, and what typically happens is they go back through and reanalyze those cases periodically. Um, over time, like those analysis pipelines may have changed, so they're able to detect different kinds of variants, or there have been like new gene phenotype associations or new information about variants published that helps resolve VUSs. Um, and so there's been a number of studies that have looked at sort of what the return rate of doing this reanalysis is. It's about like 10 to 15 percent, uh, depending on the study that you look at. And like 18 months is like the sweet spot timeline for doing that reanalysis. So this is helpful, um, but it's still very slow, and it leaves a lot of people without an answer. So we've been interested for a while in figuring out whether there are other ways to approach rare disease diagnosis that will help us solve more cases the first time through. So about five years ago, we were wrapping up the CMG program, and you might remember we were also in the middle of developing our next NHGRI strategic plan. Um, and so at that time, we were asking ourselves, you know, is exome sequencing still really the forefront of genomics? Um, of course, like one obvious limitation is that it's really only looking at a small percentage of the genome. And of course, we know from programs like ENCODE that there's a lot going on in the parts of the genome that are missed by exome sequencing. And of course, at this point, technology had continued to evolve, and so it was now feasible to go beyond exomes at a larger scale. So in 2021, we launched our Gregor program. That is a great acronym, um, which stands for Genomics Research to Elucidate the Genetics of Rare Disease. Um, the Gregor program right now is a group of five research centers and a data coordination center, and their goal is to develop new approaches to identify the causal variants for the genes, the causal genes or variants underlying Mendelian conditions when uh, strategies like exome sequencing have not been successful. Um, one of the major successes of this program has been the data release. So we release our data into Anvil. Um, we focus on limiting the number of consent groups, so we only have two, to make it easier for people to request access to the entire data set. Um, our upcoming data release will have data from over 3,100 uh, families, uh, including their phenotype data. Um, what you'll find in there is primarily short read, whole genome, and whole exome sequence. 
Um, but many of the samples also have things like RNA-seq or some of them have long read uh, sequencing. I do want to note, though, that this isn't like a coordinated data generation. So, uh, you know, the next data type that is uh, uh, generated for all these people is typically done on like a case-by-case -case sort of basis. So having data like this has enabled us to look more specifically at like how going from exome to whole genome um, impacts the ability to obtain a diagnosis. Um, this is something that was published recently by our Broad Center. So they looked at 744 cases that had already undergone that standard clinical genetic testing, usually exome sequencing. Um, and then they did short read whole genomes on those cases. Um, so they did solve more cases with that approach. In fact, they solved over 200 more. Um, but actually, most of those they found they could have actually detected with exome sequencing. They just didn't the first time. So this is sort of an example of that, uh, the impact of reanalysis. Um, and really, only 61 of those cases um, they felt could have only been solved with whole genome sequencing. And that's because of the kinds of variants that they determined were causal. They just are variants that are not detectable using exome sequencing. So what I think is really important to notice here is that still a huge number of these cases, over 500 of them, were not solved using whole genomes either. So this tells us that we still have a lot of work to do to solve this problem. So as we were thinking about what to do for the renewal of this program, we wanted to get some feedback from the broader community. So we had a workshop back in April, um, and we asked our workshop participants to think about what were the real roadblocks in this area that were preventing us from making progress. We talked about a lot of things, things that we're not even going to be able to cover in this program. And if you're interested, you can read the full workshop report on our website. Uh, but I'm going to focus on two of the themes that we discussed. So one is about the challenges in using um, emerging molecular technologies. So there are newer molecular assays that are promising and could be used more widely in a clinical genetic setting, but they're not because we need sort of a more rigorous evaluation of their utility in this context, um, benchmarking their use against sort of the standard clinical practice. Um, and developing best practices for using them effectively in this context. Um, the people also noted that there is still a need, though, to continue to innovate in thinking about how we use molecular technologies in rare disease diagnosis, um, and that we need to have a balance of those two things. So we need to have both that sort of taking more established technologies into the mainstream and allowing innovation with new technologies. Um, and then another thing that we talked about was that, you know, it might be time to think about other ways to approach this problem that are different from sort of what we were calling the sequence early approach, right? So the first thing that happens now is that we sequence a case. And then people are doing things like RNA-seq or even whole, uh, long read whole genome sequencing or other things. But those tend to be sort of the next step down the process. And a lot of times things like RNA-seq are used as more of a functional validation. And the meeting participants were talking about, you know, could we think about flipping that on its head and starting with that and wh what does that get us? Um, and then the other theme that I'll talk about is a need for continued innovation in the computational methods that we use for this kind of analysis. So even though we have whole genome sequence data, it's still really difficult to sort through the entire genome and look for and filter out and find the right candidate genes and variants, especially in the regions outside of coding regions. Um, one of the things that we talked about was that, you know, having that sort of functional data about those regions and variants would help um, sort of annotate that better, but that there are a lack of tools that really bring together the world of functional information in a, in a way that is useful for clinical geneticists to use. And so we need tools that will help with that, um, tools that will help do better analysis and integration of these kinds of data. And then we also talked about the fact that, um, you know, we call these sort of like single gene disorders, or we think about them in that way, but they're probably not always single gene disorders. And we need methods that better account for the complexity that really is probably there in these kinds of cases. So um, in our second phase, we're planning to restructure the Gregor program to really push on that innovation and try to make a fundamental change in how we think about approaching rare disease genomics. We 
wanted it so much that we decided to put it in the name. So we've been calling this Gregor Innovation or Gregor I. I thought I, Gregor, might get Apple coming after me, so we didn't do that. Um, <laughs> but um, this program will have four funding announcements, which I'll talk about now. So the first component is what we've been calling technology innovation projects. So this is where we're trying to address that need for continued innovation and thinking about how we use molecular uh, technologies in the context of identifying the causal genes and variants that underlie rare disease. So these will be like R01-sized proof-of-concept studies. We're not being prescriptive at all about this. We want to hear the community's best and most exciting ideas. Um, but it could be things like, like I discussed earlier, like trying out newer molecular technologies that haven't really been applied before in this context and seeing how effective they are in helping. Um, or it could be things like using technologies that are more established in a different way, so the alternatives to that sequence early sort of approach. Um, this program will have five uh, awards, about five awards, and they would be three-year grants. And then midway through the program, we're going to have another round of that RFA. So some of those, if they're really going well, they could renew in that phase, but also it gives us the ability to get new things in that have come up in the interim. And then the second component is kind of similar, except it's for computational innovation. Um, and this is to address the needs that we heard at the meeting for the need for continued innovation in the development of computational tools and methods for identifying the causal genes and variants. Um, one of the things that we hope to get is tools that are really geared towards a clinical genetics end user. Um, there's all kinds of things that this could encompass, but it could be things like tools that help us get more out of whole genome sequence data, um, improve tools for analyzing or integrating all kinds of molecular data to help identify, prioritize, or interpret variants, um, or things like those new methods that um, better account for more complex inheritance, et cetera. And then our third RFA is the Technology Integration Center. So this is the group that is going to lead that sort of development of best practices for using these kinds of data in clinical genetics. One thing that we're going to ask this center to do is create a more structured data set where all of the samples will have all of the data types generated, so like a data matrix. Um, and that data set will be useful for things like developing analysis tools and being able to evaluate in a more consistent way what each of those data types contribute towards identifying causal genes or variants. Um, and then this center will also work with all of the other components of the program to integrate new technologies that are coming online into that sort of data matrix um, and new uh, computational innovation as well. And for this, we plan to fund one center. And then the last RFA, it wouldn't be an NHGRI consortium without a data coordination center. Um, it's really important to us to generate and release a useful data set that can be used by others. Um, they would do sort of standard data coordination stuff like receiving data of all types and releasing it to the community in a quality controlled and harmonized way. Uh, we are again planning to use Anvil uh, to distribute the data from this program. This group would also be charged with um, centralizing and disseminating all of the protocols, tools, and other resources that are developed by the members of this program. They would do the logistical coordination and do things like plan meetings, workshops, like analysis workshops, and other sorts of outreach events. And we will have one award for that program as well. So the budget across all four activities is $12.5 million a year. Um, that is split $3 million into that te technology integration center, $2 million into the data coordination center, and then $3.75 million into each of the two um, technology and computational innovation projects. So that is what we're proposing, and we have two people that we've asked to lead the discussion, and I was going to start with Nancy, if that's okay. So I... I, I was very excited about this for a number of reasons, but I have to say, so as a scientist, the three-year R01 is a little bit painful. But as a taxpayer, and also as an <laughs> interested, actually pretty passionate observer of this area, I think it's a really good idea for this project. I really love the idea that 
that we get multiple bites at that apple on the technology and on the computation. Because I do think in three years, you will know whether something is going to work or not in these spaces. You, you for sure will. And, mm -hmm. and, and we will just innovate faster. I, I really liked the design of the program and I want to be very complimentary to whatever groups came up with this design because I, I, I think for this project, it is a really good design. And I am very excited to see how much we do innovate over this next um, phase. So it, it's an area that we, there, there's so many ways to think about innovation because you can innovate in the phenome space, you can innovate in the analytics space, you can innovate in the technology space, and I fully expect to see applications in, in all of those spaces and ways of use, new ways of using the existing data. I just, I think this is a really exciting extension to Gregor, and so I'm very enthusiastic about the the extension of the project and the RFA. And part of the reason I'm, I am so, um, the, the, a lot of the data ha is coming out. People are using this. Yeah. People are using it in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate at the beginning of Gregor. So I, I um, yeah, I'm very, very enthusiastic about this. Good, thank you. That's hard to follow. I, uh, <laughs> I hope you're as enthusiastic. <laughs> Dan's no, beyond I, the enthusiasm. I, yeah, I think this is spectacular. Um, I, 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 I agree. I really love the, the increased focus and very deliberate focus on innovation, and not just one type of innovation, but innovation in two complementary areas. I think that's critical. Um, I'm scared about three-year RFAs, but I also understand <laughs> yeah. the benefit. I think it's a... I think it's a um, that's, that's going to be exciting. Just to clarify, so there'll be actually 10 awards for each of the innovation yeah. centers and two sets of three. So I love that. I love that you get 10 awards out of that. That's awesome. Um, you know, one thing that I think is would be great to see is that the Technology Integration Center is working with the other innovation projects yeah. to coordinate data generation, for example. I've, I've seen, I don't want to get too much into RFA structure, but I've seen some structures where you know, samples that are analyzed by one set, you know, there's a, the innovation center, sorry, integration center analyzes yeah. all the samples. So, you know, something like that might be one mechanism to kind of increase um, collaboration across the center. Um, and, you know, I think there's just, you know, between this and, and IGVF that we just talked about, I think there's just incredible opportunity here um, in these RFAs. And um, I'd love to continue to see them working together and, and forming each other. Um, is the unit of analysis an individual or always a family? Uh, I mean, or is it up to the submitters to propose? It's really up to the <clears throat> submitters. And I would say even in our current Gregor program, we have kind of a mix of things. So we have a lot of trios, but like not everybody is a trio, right? Um, and <laughs> there are a lot, of, there are also singleton cases and bigger families. So it really is going to be up to uh, the centers, what they use. And who chooses the families? Are they the, from within the sites or? Who will choose them yes. in this phase? So um, the biggest amount of that is going to probably be in that technology integration center. And it's going to be up to them to propose what is going to make up that data set. I can even see that that kind of a data set could include cases that have already been solved, right, as sort of a control for this. Um, and then the, tech, the technology innovation projects as well, they'll be using whatever, whatever cases or samples are appropriate for whatever they're doing. Um, but we're not going to have anything to do with that. So can somebody nominate? Can other uh, from investigators from outside nominate trios that are undiagnosed to be studied in this consortium? So, uh, the, so currently in the Gregor program, which I would say has a little bit more focus on actually trying to solve individual cases than this is going to have. This is we're pushing a lot harder on the methods development and the approaches in this second phase. Um, but currently, people who have 
uh, cases or families or whatever that they want to work with Gregor Centers to, we do have a mechanism for them to contact them. I would imagine that we would continue to do something like that, but we haven't really talked about that. That'd be in great. great. And one last question. I didn't see any mention of phenotyping in this discussion. Right. So phenotyping <laughs> is an important part of this, but we're not really. Um, that would be part of the data that all of these groups would include. It's an important part of uh, doing rare disease uh, analysis. I think it does deserve a mention because no matter how good you are at genomics, unless you have a good phenotype, right. you're not going to diagnose it. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we've been paying a lot of attention to that in the first phase of Gregor for sure. Um, this is kind of an extension of Iftikhar's question. Sorry, my back is too No, you're fine. <laughs> um, so I'm a giant fan of the program, and I think it's really important. But I am concerned about that gap of, um, of it moving more toward the technology and away from solving cohorts, which it's historically done, yep. as just looking at our UDN data, which is, you know, of course, a different group and where Iftikhar should send his trio. Um, but 70% um, of the genetic diagnoses we made in our UDN at Washington were missed on clinical sequencing. They were there, they were missed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the expertise of the Gregor group in analyzing data for unsolved things is really unmatched. And the ability for an investigator who has a cohort or 10 of 12 or 20 of something to have experts really comb through it when they're not solving it there's going to be nowhere else to go, and I really hate to lose that component. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right. This is a change from what we've been doing in this space for the last X number of years, right? Um, and it's not that we don't think that that is an important thing to be happening. Of course we do. Uh, but there are programs, and we invest in the UDN. Um, there are a lot of other places where that kind of work is happening. And I also imagine that these groups that are currently funded will keep doing that. They're just not going to be doing it within the context of this program necessarily. So we're not saying that we don't think that that's important. But where we think NHGRI's sort of focus needs to be is on pushing forward in the innovation in that space. Um, just a question about um, whether the rare disease provides such a filter for sites that you can't more explicitly request or talk about diversity, because I didn't see that very much in the concept sheet. And it could be that if you just apply these two filters, it's too tough. But I do think the potential scientific meat on going to kind of African populations mm -hmm. might be worthwhile. Yeah, so, so there's only so much we can fit in a two-page concept, and you're right. Um, we did include that in our first phase of Gregor, um, and we, we tried to increase the diversity of that data set for, the reason, for those reasons. Um, we'll include language like that as well in these RFAs, but we just, it just didn't fit in the concept. But no explicit like percentage cutoffs of the 500 individuals blank. Um, I hadn't really thought about it, but that's definitely something that we can talk about internally and uh, figure out. So thank you. Looking at the graph you showed earlier, mm -hmm. it, it looked like the <clears throat> proportion of cases solved by sequencing was actually going down. Yeah. And I guess it raises the question of whether there's a point of diminishing returns looking at the protein compo encoding component of the genome. And I yeah. wonder if the emphasis now needs to be on looking at um, non-protein coding sequences. Yeah, so there's all kinds of ways that you could interpret that, right? And that graph came from a paper that came out a few years ago, but the data in it has been updated. And they talk about this in that paper as well. And so one of the potential reasons is that it takes so long still to publish it. And so those are like published uh, associations. And that is where you see that drop off. Um, but what you said could also be part of the reason behind that drop off, that we are getting to the point where it's, we're, I mean, it's true. We're getting to the point where a lot of these cases are going to be more difficult to solve, and it's going to take more time and more effort uh, and different ways of thinking about it. Um, so yeah, your, your point is well taken. Not to mention, I mean, we can be unlucky in the rare variant space, but we can be unlucky in the common variant space. And some of these cases are just unlucky in a different part of the space. I, I mean, I, I really think um, there's a tale of really sick people who just have bad polygenic luck. 
you know, bad common variant. We could all be unlucky. Do you want to say something? Kyle? No? Okay, anybody else? All right, then can we have a motion to approve? Second, and all in favor, hands up. Looks like everybody, okay, thank you very much. You're good to go, thank you, Lisa.